Hello everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be talking about the VS Code Raylib workflow that I've been using in my videos and I will continue to use in my videos for all of my demo projects. If we take a look at the Raylib GitHub repo, we can see that there is an examples and a projects folder within Raylib. The examples is a ton of examples created by Ray and a bunch of other Raylib contributors to show off some of the features in Raylib and some of the absolute most basic ways that you will accomplish some of the everyday tasks in Raylib. But back on the root of the repo, you can see there's this projects folder. And in here, there's example projects for a bunch of different common editors. So you can see here, the VS code is only really for Windows and Mac OS. There's no configuration in there for Linux. If you're using Linux, you're probably using Sublime Text, or of course you can just use CMake directly through the terminal. So if you have your own local copy of Raylib as I do, then you can go into the projects folder where there's the VS Code folder, and we can just copy this somewhere and we can kind of use this as a template when we're building a Raylib project. So I can create a new empty folder and just copy these contents. By the way, if you wanna open a folder in VS Code, it's easiest if you can actually select the folder and just drag it into this main central area. If we have a .vs code folder in there, then it can initialize these and use these to help set up our workspace. So just to give a really quick overview of what's in here, there's the C and CPP properties, which is gonna set some important things like include path so that our editor will be able to tell us if a file we're including doesn't exist. And there's also some other helpful things, the C standard and CPP standard so that if you're trying to use something that isn't supported by the standard that you are going to be compiling to, then it can help you out with that. To be fair, this compiler path value isn't going to be used by the make file, which is really what drives the build. Our build workflow is a matter of the launch and tasks JSON files, which we're going to get at in a second, and the make file itself. And those are kind of the, the pipeline. So when we try to launch a program by pressing F5, it's going to perform one of these launch operations. So for instance, if we have debug selected, then it's going to try and run this program which is gonna be workspace folder, file base name, no extension. So if we have main.c selected, that's kind of, it's looking for main.exe. And we can see there's a path to the debugger that we're gonna be using. And there's a pre-launch task, which is build debug. And we can see where this is defined in tasks.json. So build debug is here. And we can see that it has some arguments. So it's gonna make sure we're on desktop. It's gonna build it in debug mode. There's a project name, which the project name will be defined by whatever the current file we're looking at is. So again, main, and there's an object here, which is then also being overridden again here. This is just, again, we're using this for the actual make file. We'll see what all of that means shortly. And there's also an OSX case that's already set up here. And then there's a build release and it's a lot of the same stuff. But the idea is that when we press F5, it's gonna trigger that launch, which is gonna trigger this task. And in order to build what we're talking about in the tasks here, it runs the command make. Now, when we run this command make, it's going to run the make file. Now there's this big blob at the top here. This is a comment that is from Ray that is basically like a license. If you're working in a closed source scenario, if you're doing something that's actually commercial and you're not going to be sharing the source, then based on what I've read here, it's not required that you leave this stuff in, but I think it's a, it's a, it's easy to do. Comments don't affect the built program. It's 20 lines, whatever. That being said, we are free to modify this file to suit our needs. And we're going to be doing that today. Now this make file is a particularly large make file. If I just quickly scroll through this whole thing here, we're hitting 400 lines, no problem. Now a lot of this stuff is huge blocks of comments like this here. And for the purposes of actually explaining what's going on here today, I'm gonna clear all this stuff out. Okay, so I've just moved through and moved a bunch of the comments and now we're down to 300 lines. Granted, like I said, I still kept this 20 lines up here and there is a few blocks that I did keep because I think they are helpful. So the idea is that at the top here is a bunch of parameters that we might actually change. So for instance, the Raylib path dot, 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 this is saying go up two directories and where it used to be in Raylib, Raylib examples, that was true. Now I need to actually define the path to be what it really is. And since I know it's exactly here, I'd rather give an absolute path. So we can set up the project name. We can set up important paths, which generally you're only going to have to do once. Most of these down here, we're not going to change ever really except for build mode so I'll move build mode up here because it is just helpful to be able to switch between release and debug recall that the launch and tasks are going to make this debug anyways this little thing here the question mark means we're setting it only if it hasn't already been set so project name is going to end up getting set to main so even though it says game here it's actually being stomped out by 
the Visual Studio pipeline, and we're going to address that later. So this first section here, this is our first bit of, of switching logic, where based on the current platform, we're just trying to figure out uh, you know, the platform OS and things like this that we're going to use later. So this first part here is all just switching based on the platform. There's a special section here for web builds, and I will be making a follow-up video at some point talking about building for web because there's a few changes you have to make to your program. And there's just some helpful things that it will be nice to go over regarding HTML and CSS that are just related to making a more presentable web build. Down here is the first parameter that you might actually want to change if you're using C++ instead. I want to remind you that Raylib is built in C and it's built in C in such a way that it can be used in C++ plug and play. Like you don't need to change virtually anything about Raylib. You do have to edit your make file, but that's a given. You have to change your build pipeline if you're changing the language. But if you are going to use C++ and Raylib, I strongly recommend that you actually seek out one of the C++ bindings where they make better use of the language specific features of C++. Down here is another really important thing that we're defining. So it's the C flags, which is compiler flags. These are the flags for GCC that will change how the program is built. One that's really important is the standard of the language, considering if you're using certain language features that were added later, you'll want to change this value. Also wall, which means to turn on pretty much all of the warnings that there are. Warnings are warnings are notes from the compiler that won't prevent the program from building or running. They're just flags that are saying, you might want to take a closer look at this. There may be a mistake. Sometimes they can be really annoying, but generally speaking, if you have warnings, you should address them. These are just hints to keep you on the path of the standard of the language instead of just, you know, just because it compiles and it works on your machine doesn't mean it's always going to work. And warnings kind of help bridge that gap. We don't have to worry about changing really any of these C flags right now. This make file that we got from the VS code template, there's actually a bit of a mistake here, at least in my version, which is that we're defining two linking flags in the compiler flags. So C flags is for the compiler. We're going to see in just a little bit that there's also the LD flags for the linker. And these are linker flags. We're trying to link the Raylib RC data file, which gives us the little Raylib icon for the app. This linking flag here is going to hide the console window when we open the app. So by default, we're going to get a command prompt whenever we run our app. And by including this in the linking flags, it'll prevent that. If we leave these in the compiler flags, then we're going to get a bunch of extra warnings when we get to multiple source files later. And we're not going to be properly blocking the console window, which is something that we, we want to do at least when we're building for release. So for now, I'm going to cut these and stick them in a notepad. The next notable thing here is the include paths declaration, which is where we specify any directories that the compiler should look for header or .h files. These two that are at the end are going to allow us to find important header files that Raylib needs, as well as some things that we can use directly in our program. Just as an example, if we first look in source, we can see there's quite a few header files. Of course, the, one of the most important ones, Raylib, which is the kind of the core header that we need in all of our examples. Also Raymath, which I like to use in a lot of my demos, that one is in here. Also a few other really cool utils that I don't think we've covered yet on the channel, like easings, like Fizak. And then beyond that, we also have the source external. And there's a bunch of headers in here that we can use directly in our program that I don't know if or when I'll get to, but we need these at least for a bunch of the Raylib utilities. So it's important that we include them. Next up is the LD flags. So these are gonna be used for the linker. And this is where there was that piece that I knew we were missing from before. So I'm gonna go ahead and paste it here. So I wanna to add to the LD flags, as long as we're on Windows, I wanna make sure that I'm adding the RC data. And specifically in the case where we are building the release, I want to add this so that we don't get the console. By the way, if you don't feel comfortable editing the make file and you don't wanna worry about doing that while you're following along with the video, I'm going to include a finished version of this template in the description. Moving along here, there's also this LD libs, which what value we're going to use is going to be very platform specific. I don't want to get into how a linker works at the very high level because it's quite a complicated subject. It's not really necessary that we understand how it works at such an intimate level in order to use the make file. At this point, we've defined almost all of the parameters for the build, and there's just a few last minute things here before we get to the recipes. There is a recursive wildcard function that was written here that I have not been able to get to work, so I'm just going to be removing. Next, we have the source dir and object dir, which are the directories for the source files and the build files, respectively. Next here, we're defining all the object files from the source files. 
So we're using this recursive wildcard function, which I've just removed to grab all of the source files. And then there's this commented out, basically it's like a path substitution where we're replacing every mention of a source directory with an object directory and replacing every dot C with dot O, but it's commented out. We really want this. So I'm going to uncomment this and I'm going to remove this old objects line. Now I'm going to replace this recursion call with the regular GNU make wildcard call. And I want to grab all of the source files from the source dir. So what this line is going to do now is it's going to grab every .c file from the source directory and store them all as a list in here. Then this object is going to be set equal to this source interpreted as a list. But for each entry, we're going to replace the source directory with the object directory and we're going to replace .c with .o. This line is us defining all of the object files that we're going to need in order to actually link the executable and build our program. Now we're getting down here to the recipes. So the main recipe is the all recipe, which is what's going to be called when we just type in make in the terminal. And when we do that, it's going to call make again with make file params. And our default value of make file params is going to be the name of the project. In order to build the main, it needs to have all of the object files. And for each object file that we're missing, here is how we get them from the source code. So this recipe right here is one of the most important ones. This is us calling the actual compilation on the files. So this will generate all of our .o files. And then we'll be able to come back up here once they're all up to date and we can link them together. So these are the, the kind of three main recipes. So for now, I'm gonna go over to main.c and press F5 and we're gonna see what happens. Okay, so I pressed F5 on main.c and I got the uh, compiled program just like we would really come to expect. So at this point, we've made a bunch of changes to the make file, but we haven't broken the functionality, which is that I can select a single .c file, press F5, and it will build the game. Now, if your workflow is gonna involve editing a single .c file and spinning out an exe, then you're done, congratulations but we have a lot more stuff that I wanna cover in this video. First of all, there's no notice in this comment here that I need to actually maintain it for any source distributions, so I'm just gonna remove that to simplify this. Now, if I select something other than main.c, for example, if I select the make file and hit F5, then I can see there's an error down here which says no rule to make target makefile.c needed by makefile. That's because it's defining the project name as the file that I currently have open. So you can see here, project name is makefile and objects is makefile.c. This is because of how the launch and tasks JSON files are set up. So first I'm gonna to go to tasks and right here we're defining the project name and the objects based on the current file name. So I'm gonna remove anything that has this file base name, no extension. I don't want these anymore. Next in the launch.json, I'm gonna do a similar thing, except I can't just delete this because we need to specify the program. Otherwise when we press F5, it's gonna build, but we're not actually gonna run anything. Workspace folder is okay, but right here, I'm just going to go ahead and write main. And for Windows, I'm going to write main.exe. By the way, if you want to call it something else, you can change that here. Just make sure that this part matches up here. And of course, I'm going to do this for the other configuration as well. Now, the last thing I want to do is in the make file, I want to make sure to update my project name to main to match what I just changed over there. Now, if we inspect this terminal really quick, it says GCCO main, and it's trying to build a file just called main. So that reminds me that we should probably add a definition for the extension here. Since I'm on Windows, that's going to be .exe. But of course, this doesn't totally fix everything. We're still getting these crazy errors. And trying to understand this error, which is C, Raylib, W64, DevKit, bin, dot, 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 lib, gcc, i6, This is like nonsense. We don't even know what this means. But I'll just tell you right now that I've got a suspicion that there's an issue with acquiring the source and the object files. If we can jump back down here, we can see that we're scanning the source directory for all the C files, and we're using those to define the object. So what's happening is we're trying to build main.exe, but we have no code units that we can actually use. So I need to make sure that I actually move the main.c file into the source folder like so. Pressing F5 again, great success. So we're back where we were before. We're building the game. Again, we're still using just the one file and we haven't really accomplished anything except for the main difference that now I can have the make file selected and I can press F5 and it still works. The main reason that we wanted to change that particular feature, by the way, is because when we're working in multiple files, you might have a different code file open when you press F5. Having main selected isn't gonna help you at all. Okay, at this point, we need to introduce a new file. So in source, I'm gonna create a new file and I'm gonna call it second.c. This is just my second source file. We need to have a prototype before the function is ever called and ideally even before we define it. So we also need to add a header file. I'll just give it the same name as the .c file and match the convention. Now in our header file, we should start with something like this. This is an include guard. This is something that we want to use to make sure that if we were to have second.h included twice in the same file, we wouldn't actually include it twice in that file and cause a bunch of crazy errors. What this is saying is if not defined second.h, meaning there is no second underscore h underscore, that term is not defined yet anywhere in the program, then we will define it as being everything that is 
after this define, but before this end if. We can leverage Visual Studio Code's code snippet feature to make it so that adding this boilerplate to every new header file will be a little bit easier. It's always gonna be if not defined, define, end if, and these two things will always be equal. We can do this really simply. Control Shift P opens the command palette and we can type in snippets to see configure user snippets. You can make it a snippet file for this project since we're gonna be using this project as a template. So when we click on new snippets file, we need to type in a name that we're gonna store the snippets in. I'll just call it snippets because I don't really care. And there's a huge thing on exactly how it's gonna look for us to create a new snippet. So if we go ahead and uncomment this example, we can use this as a template. I'm gonna remove the scope requirement, replace this prefix with header, and I'm gonna paste these into the body. Now each line needs to be in quotations like this, and they should be comma separated as well. We can use these numbered values to basically set parameters in the snippet. I'm gonna put $1 where we have this second H, since that's like the first parameter of the snippet. And I'm gonna put $0 in this white space since that's where the cursor will end when we're done with the snippet. Also, we can label these variables like so, so that we're reminded of what we're actually supposed to put there. And now we should just put a proper description. Okay, now let's go ahead and try this thing out. So if I type in header, we get this include guard. I can hit enter. I can go second underscore H. And when I hit tab, it's gonna put my cursor in here and now I can start writing my file. Now in our second.h, let's go ahead and define some new function. I'm using the very typical way of naming a function that does nothing. And in second.c, we're gonna wanna include second.h, which you'll notice it comes up here in our list. And now we can give this function a real body. Now printf doesn't actually exist here. We're in our own translation unit and printf is not a real thing yet. Second.h never mentions it. When it comes to including things that we actually need to define the functions, we want to try to keep those in this translation unit because we don't want to wastefully be including things in this header file. We want to try and keep this lightweight. The whole purpose of splitting up the source is to try and make the project a little more lightweight. So now in our main file, I'm going to go ahead and include second.h. And right before we init the window, I'm going to run fun1. So just as a review, we have main.c, which is the actual program. Then we have second.c and then we have second.h. Second.h doesn't need to be compiled, it's just a header file, but second.c and main.c both need to be compiled and then linked in order to build the app. Let's go ahead and press F5 and see if anything breaks. Sure enough, the game built just fine, and if I scroll up in the terminal, we can see way down here, fun one is happening now in the middle of my log. I forgot to put a new line at the end of it, so it kind of looks bad. I can make it more obvious if I put a few new lines. And to demonstrate that we don't need to have main.open, I will actually press F5 from this file this time. And we can see if we scroll up there, fun one is happening now. For the most part, we have everything we need to be able to create multi-file projects. So in the spirit of trying to make these videos a little bit shorter, I'm gonna go ahead and stop here. We've got VS Code in a place where we've got a little sample project. We can use it as a template to create multi-file projects moving forward. I'm going to release a follow-up video here where I'm going to take the Apple Catcher project that we just built in my last video, and I'm going to break that up into multiple files, and we can see the benefits of the simplified compilation, and we can also see what kind of refactor is involved there. And you're going to find that taking a project that was originally single file and making it multiple files is not actually the most uh, exciting thing, and it's not really easy. It's quite error-prone. But if we design our project from the beginning with this in mind, it will make development a lot faster. We're going to break that up into multiple files and we're going to see how that changes the workflow. Thanks so much for watching. If you liked the video, please give it a like. If you want to subscribe, I've got more videos coming in Raylib and C. Eventually we'll move on to C++. We're going to start ramping up here on the, on the channel's content. So be sure to come back and check that out and leave me a comment down below if you've got a fun idea for a game project that we can tackle or something that you want to see me cover, whether it's Raylib, C, C++, let me know in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.